Nope. I, I don't have any. I don't have any. Right, let's get back to some boring subjects. Understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to We Are Libertarians. My name is Chris Spangle. Thank you for joining us here on the program. We are going to talk about the Afghan papers today and uh, how your government lies to you about war. It seems very pressing at the moment. So stay tuned for that. We'll be back right after this. Warning. This show is for adults, produced by semi-adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh. Welcome to We Are Libertarians, where our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. We examine current events from a libertarian perspective while treating modern politics with all of the irreverence it deserves. There has been lie after lie. We toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, a 15-year veteran of politics and media, Chris Spangle. Welcome to the program. My name is Chris Spangle. So happy to have all of you here. It's going to be quite the fun evening. We're going to talk about the Afghan papers, explain exactly what that is. A surprisingly, uh, surprising and interesting trove of documents uncovered by the Washington Post. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about San Francisco. I went to San Francisco, so check that out. Uh, here on the program joining me is Harry Price. Harry, how are you doing? I'm going good, but I wish I, you know, Spangle listened to me so I can go get some water. All right, go ahead. I claim I clearly said I didn't have my water bottle, and you just hit play. Don't listen I don't know to me. how many weeks in a row that we've done this on Tuesday at 7 p.m., but it's got to be several, uh, a couple hundred at this point, right? Uh, my 2020 contract clearly states. Just go get your water. That the show go can never start until I have my coffee and my water. I don't have time for this. We're very busy introducing Reinhold. Reinhold, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Um, my only problem is right now I just realized I have a picture of Kanye West shaking his head at me on my other screen. It's kind of throwing me off. Maybe yeah, Harry, <laughs> we, I put the link into the, to the chat, and then Harry just sent a Kanye shaking his head no. So like, does that mean you're coming on the going. show? Or you just, yeah, I don't, I don't know. He's, he's off his rocker. Um, so Reinhold, how are you? How's your week been? My week has been good. It's been busy. Work has been, uh, picking up, which is good. So That's fun very... times, spending a lot of time working. It's hard out there, Reinholding. Uh, well, I wanted to talk, I wanted Harry in on this. That's why I asked you such a banal question that the relevance is an audience of you. Uh, <laughs> so I went to San Francisco, and Harry last week after we ended the show goes, just be careful. It's it's really – it lives up to the hype. Uh, and I went to San Francisco, and I was there for approximately a day. I got a good walking tour of San Francisco. Uh, started in Chinatown, walked up to the Coat Tower, took an Uber over to Haight-Ashbury. Let me tell you, Haight-Ashbury, uh, have you ever been to San Francisco, Reinhold? I have not been to San Francisco. I was close once driving from Fresno to LA, but I did not make the trip. Yeah. So hate Ashbury smells exactly like you think it would dirty clothes, patchouli and weed. Uh, I couldn't have hated that hippie town anymore. If I tried, there were some really cool stores there that, that the capitalism was great in hate Ashbury, but the hippies, here's the thing about hippies. They love to copy what was popular in 1967. So from 1967 on, there's just been a parade of 20-year-olds acting as if they live in 1967. They wear the same stupid hats that, like, the lead singer of Leonard Skinner that died in the plane crash war and, and bad jeans and tie-dye. It's like, dude, it's 2020. Quit pretending to be, be interesting, be different. Don't just be a hippie and copy what seven generations have done now. It, just, it, it was really annoying. I hated hate Ashbury, but I loved San Francisco. I, I walked all around kind of downtown. You know, the way that you judge the cleanliness of a city is when you're walking down the street and look at this, where the sidewalk meets the building, that little crack, that 90 degree angle, that tells you if a city is clean and, and it, are there a bunch of weeds in the cracks and are the weeds growing out of that particular crack? Is there like gunk and, and there wasn't any of that in San Francisco. It was one of the cleanest, it was probably the cleanest major city I've ever been in. 
uh, here in Indianapolis, the homeless are much more in your face. I didn't see any homeless people until late that night. I ended up in the Tenderloin, which is apparently where all the homeless people hang out. Every Uber driver said, yeah, go down to the Tenderloin. Well, I ended up going to this horrible Mexican restaurant in the Tenderloin uh, late at night. Mm. And there I saw my first pile of human poop. And there were p- homeless people everywhere, but that's where I guess all the nonprofits are headquartered. So that's kind of where the population is. But Chinatown, downtown, the Presa- Presario, like or whatever it is, all, Presidio. Like, Presidio, like there was, there were eight-year-olds walking together home without adult supervision in a downtown major city. I, I haven't even seen that here in Indianapolis. So. I really loved it. So, Harry, I don't know what your experiences were when you went out there, but frankly, I loved the city. I thought it was super interesting. I could spend a month there and not exhaust what I was doing and not step in a pile of human poop. Well, every time I've gone there, nah, nah, not the case. Really? See, yeah, no, yeah. They're there, you know, maybe because I mean, was walked around more at, you know, at night in different areas, but no, there they were. Yeah. On the area, there was poop. It was I loved disgusting. It. I loved the city. Uh, I, I, f- I found it fascinating, but um, hated L.A. L.A. lived up to oh, all yeah. the – L.A. was worse than the hype. <laughs> like, we did a whole episode on what a failed city L.A. is. Yeah. I will tell you that San Francisco has gotten better at, like, power washing mm. and getting the poo away, the poo patrol. Mm-hmm. But – doesn't mean it's not still there. I think maybe because it was more in like probably the uh, Oakland Fremont area, maybe I saw it more often, but no, it mm. was there. Yeah, the, the one of the Uber drivers said that if you, you know, right around at five in the morning, you see a lot of neighbors like power washing their sidewalks and their mm-hmm. houses. And they apparently have some sort of commie law there that if uh, your neighbor's not keeping up their house, then you can turn them into the to the government and the government makes them fix up their house. So that's why all the houses all the crown work and windows and it just was spotless in downtown San Francisco. Yep. So yep. I didn't, didn't make it to Oakland though. Yeah. And it's like I said, it's maybe it's just the pocket that, you know, I dealt with and you just didn't get to see, but yeah, if you're up late at night or just walking around, that's, that was my experience. It was dreadful. You know, so and I've I've gone to other major cities. Not like I've just experienced Indianapolis. Nope, I've walked around New York City and I've walked around Boston. I honestly, without the anger, I prefer Boston. Oh yeah, I, Boston's probably my favorite big city. Yeah, Boston makes me angry though. Why? The mass holes. It's the mass holes. <laughs> yeah, it's the people that live in Boston. If you get rid of the people that lived in Boston, Boston's gorgeous. I really, really, really like Dallas, too. Hmm. But you know what city that I continually think about, and I hated it while I was there, was Las Vegas. When I was in Las Vegas, I hated it. I hated every person, and I have thought about Vegas ever since, and I don't know if it's the sunshine or what, thinking about going for a weekend. And I don't gamble. I don't drink. I just, And I think maybe it was my first family vacation since I was a little kid, so maybe that's part of it. It was just I was there with my family for the first time in a long time. But the uh you know we've i got a i had a layover in vegas and i was flying into it on friday and i was just like you know i have a strong urge to stay here maybe go to the pool landed in vegas i said you know hey can i stay for a day like can i just move my ticket to tomorrow and they said no you got to buy a new ticket and then i looked at the weather and it was 50 degrees and i thought a guy i thought it was hot in vegas all year round but apparently it must i don't know if it was a fluke or what but Vegas is one of those cities where it was just like, I don't know, I, I didn't particularly care for it while I was there. I was going off my SSRIs, and maybe that was part of it, but uh, I, I really did like Vegas. So, uh, Reinhold, what are some of your favorite big cities? Well, I, I do like L.A., but only certain parts of L.A. Uh-huh. Um, so, so that's good. I really prefer, like, um, Big Sur on the west coast uh california north part of it it's beautiful redwoods everything it's just it's a really great place to to be at um new orleans is really fun if you're in the right area new orleans trashiest city i've ever been to i will never ever go back to new orleans ever (laughs) hated it but it's but it's fun i had it's it's a good time i will say that um where else um I, I used to live in Orlando 
uh, I will try to avoid ever going back there again. Uh, that, <laughs> Orlando sucks. It really, it's yeah. like, it's just all interstate and it just, it's hot and congested. It's, it's a shit city. It was, it was, it was just so humid. It's, it's, if you were on the East coast or the West coast of Florida, you get the breeze in, you get a little bit of, of knockdown mm-hmm. of the humidity, but right in the middle, it's just oppressive. Yeah. Well, the only time it's really nice out is as the sun goes down, mm-hmm. then you can go outside at night and it, you know, feels like it feels like LA does all the time. I think the most per- perfect moment I've ever had in the city, the city that I liked the most was Concord, New Hampshire. And I was oh, going yeah. to um, Port. You pronounce, it wrong. you pronounce it wrong, though. But Concord is how they say it. <laughs> it's not Concord, it's Concord. Is how yeah, they say Concord. It. I, was, I was admonished while I was there. But it was like a perfect yes. 70 degree, beautiful, sunny summer day in June. And it was just picturesque. They had like a street fair and it looked like Pleasantville. It was super clean. Yeah. It was, it was, I had the best meal. It was, it's the best. It was the mm-hmm. best city. I loved it. I almost moved there. And then I, mm-hmm. then I got up towards Porkfest and I saw the Snowmobile Museum <laughs> Hall of Fame. And I was like, I'm not living someplace where snowmobiles are needed. <laughs> Concord I, is pretty cool. Uh, did they finish the um, the downtown, like the walk heated project? Because they were doing a lot of different things to make sure the sidewalks and everything was heated uh, during the winter. I did not see that. I was there in June. Okay. So, no, I'm saying, did they finish the project? They probably did. Yeah. I didn't so, inspect their sidewalks that oh, hard. Oh, yeah. Because they redid a lot of that in downtown Concord. So, like, so it's just a little more enjoyable, you know. So I do have a Boston story. Okay. Oh, yeah, Boston. So I went to Boston um, with my wife. It was her 40th birthday. We were going up there. We were taking some dogs up for um, for the shelter that she was working for. They were getting adopted up in, in New England area. Mm-hmm. So we decided to take the, the weekend since it was her birthday and spend the weekend in Boston. Um, have a little fun there. Um, so we were seeing all the sites. We were looking at all the... The, especially the ones that related to the independence and the, you know, the church and everything else mm-hmm. and where they, where they met and, and all that. And we're out standing outside the church uh, where they, you know, raise the, um, you know, what if by land to us by sea thing. Uh, so we're, we're standing outside of this and we're just admiring it and taking in the, the history and some guy is walking along eating a banana and he takes the banana peel and just throws it on the front of the steps of the place and walks on. And it took everything I had, not just go pummeling to death. Boston is one of those cities where, like, I I go there and I come back and I'm just like, America, fuck you! Yeah. Like, you, you go and tour all the historical sites, and it's it gets you pumped and makes you so excited about uh, the founding of this country. And then you like look at where the country's at, and you just go, oh, how far we've come. Uh, Daniel oh, Hackett, we- Daniel Hackett Fisher wrote a great book called Paul Revere's Ride about the the history of the ride and. You know, it's, it's the real it's history. Bastard, the real history has been bastardized, but it's a great picture of Boston and that area and what it was like. It's a really great book. If you're into history, David Hackett Fisher's uh, Paul Revere's Ride. Well, we, we left from there and then spent the afternoon touring around Salem. So we got a little bit of both uh, sides of the. <laughs> <laughs> she wanted to go see it just for, yeah. for that reason. She wanted to see what happened to her people, as it were. <laughs> Uh, well, there's a park actually now where they used to, where they used to hang people the witch shells. They uh, they put a park there. Most surprising park. small city, Toledo. I drove through Toledo. Uh, I've driven through it several times, and every time I've driven through Toledo, I can't believe how much I like it. Hmm. I've only stopped saw it. times. I've not stayed there. I've only driven through it. But Toledo, surprisingly clean and historical look like it's a really nice town cincinnati gets another shout out too. the, the oh, yeah. over the rhine district is amazing yeah. now cincinnati's all it's gorgeous i love it i like the fun part of cincinnati um some would call that newport kentucky but mm. uh <laughs> but yeah i love going to Cincinnati. that's uh, one of my you know quick Mary in indiana worst small city i've ever been in <laughs> oh is that is that your worst small city easily oh do you consider Gary a small city? Uh, I guess, yeah. I mean, I think Marion may have been worse than Gary. Uh, 
Uh, I don't know about that. <laughs> I mean, are we talking Gary when the Jackson Five were growing up there? Now, I mean, Marion now is like, oof, just needs a coat of paint. <laughs> one one thing, <laughs> yeah. One thing about Cincinnati I will bring up is that it is very beautiful in the beginning of the my one of my favorite TV shows ever, WKRP in Cincinnati. Mm-hmm. So that's that's when you get to see the kind of the way it used to be. It it's still nice now, but I kind of miss the old architecture. They're they're kind of going away from that, trying to be more modern. All right, let's hop into it. Let's talk about tonight's. Uh, main event. It is the Afghan Papers, published by the Washington Post, and the bulk of this comes from um, there. The uh, there was a project. It was a byproduct of a project led by John Sopko, the head office of the Specter in the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction, known as Cigar, and that agency was created in 2008 to investigate waste and fraud in the war zone. And in 2014, at SOCO's direction, Cigar departed from its uh, usual mission of performing audits and launched a side venture. And basically what they did in a project called Lessons Learned, the $11 million project went and uh, diagnosed the failures of the policies in Afghanistan. And they interviewed more than 600 people who had firsthand experience in war And they published seven lessons from their Lessons Learned report in 2016 that highlight the problems in Afghanistan. Now, the Washington Post has basically been fighting to get these documents ever since, and the interviews. Uh, They had to twice sue Cigar in federal court to compel it to release the documents. So after a three-year legal battle, the Washington Post released thousands of U.S. government documents pertaining to the war in Afghanistan. And the documents reveal that the senior U.S. officials in our government, the government that you pay for, failed to tell the truth about the war in Afghanistan throughout the entire 18-year campaign. And it hid unmistakable the, the Pentagon, the White House, the CIA, the State Department, et al., uh, hid unmistakable evidence that the war had become unwinnable almost from the very beginning. Um, And so these documents that got released have some incredible quotes uh, from various levels of government officials, uh, aid workers, basically at every level talking about how this was a complete quagmire from top to bottom. And we're going to bring you uh, several of those quotes and talk about it along the way. Um, But let me get first reactions on this. Uh, when you heard that there was a trove of documents that proved that United States officials had been lying to us about the Afghan, Afghan war, Harry, what was your first thought? You got to unmute yourself, bro. Come on. Otherwise, I'm going to make you drive all the way down here. Well, the thing is, I, I thought I hotkeyed it to like my uh, mouse button. So it should just like I press the yeah. mouse button, not mouse button, uh, the space bar, mute, unmute. Every, unmute. every time you're not on the ball, I'm going to make you drive one extra mile. Oh, no. Move the studio one extra mile south. It's just, that's trash. What that's were your trash. first reactions when you heard it? When I first heard about the report, I always wondered like what it was like, you know, or the, and what it would really talk about and how they actually knew about it, you know, because there are several different reports of, um, uh, Colin Powell talking about um, the Afghan war when he this re- main reason he was left you know he was yeah. like this is you know this is what was going on and it wasn't nothing was concrete about it so I kind of stuck to like maybe it was just this is the intelligence that he saw and this is like oh no there's more <laughs> uh, Reinhold you're old enough to remember the Pentagon Papers um, you might have even written them uh, you were a naval officer <laughs> but Pentagon Papers were a RAND study basically of uh, were they the RAND study? No, they were held at the RAND Institute. They were held at the RAND Institute. Yeah. yeah so uh, who was the guy, the main guy, uh, Daniel? Uh, Ellsberg. Ellsberg worked at the RAND Institute. And, and there was a study commissioned by, the, um, uh, by McNamara, who was the former, like, what was his position at Ford? Was it like chief financial officer of Ford? And he got hired to run the government, and he was a total analytics nerd. And so he wanted to find the analytics of the Afghan war. And so he had them put together the entirety of the war. Like he had people combing all these memos and emails and everything from 
the beginning to the to, to his time in the in the late sixties, like everything that was going on in the war, and it was held at the at the uh, Rand Institute, and Ellsberg found a copy of it, and basically it showed from the very beginning, the the war in Vietnam was unwinnable, and you know how did that end up coming out? How how did it get released? So the the Washington Post, and, and when you say you know what my first thought of when I when I hear about the the Afghan papers as we can call them was there's a stick song called haven't we been here before right yeah. so so what happened was is that the uh, the post again released the first sele- section of the uh, paper so they just released like the first part of it right and then uh, Nixon and his White House sued to keep them from releasing any more for national security York, reasons and all that stuff. The New York Times, yeah, the New York Times put it out and then they got blocked. That was the post. Yeah, no, the Times published it because I think Ellsberg had gone to the New York Times reporter that is famous for reporting in in Vietnam and they mm-hmm. got blocked and so the Washington Post is like, "Well, we're not blocked." So they that's what the post is about, the movie with Tom yeah. Hanks. And so they published a report and then then they fought in court and won the right to publish it. Yeah, the uh, Supreme Court, including two uh, justices that I believe that Nixon um, put up onto the court, hmm. came back with a 9-0 decision telling him, no, you, this has got to go through. So. Hilarious. Yeah, so, yeah. Th- you know, and the, the Afghan papers are very similar in that it just shows that government officials hid evidence from the American people at every single level. Um, go watch the post if you're not into studying too hard, but, you know, look into the Pentagon papers if you don't know much about them. Um, Another thing that you'll find is a lot of this information was validating of everything that Chelsea Manning Mm -hmm. leaked. Um, Who's in prison. Who's still in prison right now. Exactly. And we'll talk more about that. But uh, let's dive in here with a few of these quotes and fellas jump in at anything that jumps out at you. Um, Douglas Lute, a three-star army general who served as the White House Afghan war czar during the Bush and Obama administrations, told government interviewers in 2015, quote, we were devoid of a fundamental understanding of Afghanistan. We didn't know what we were doing. Again, that's a three-star general who served as the White House Afghan war czar (laughs) under Bush and Obama. Uh, He added, what are we trying to do here? We didn't have the foggiest notion of what we were undertaking. Lute went as far as to blame the deaths of U.S. military personnel on bureaucratic incompetence among Congress, the Pentagon, and the State Department by saying, if the American people knew the magnitude of this dysfunction, 2,400 lives lost, who will say this was in vain? So here's some of the cost of this particular war. Since 2001, more than 775 thousand almost you know three quarters of a million u.s troops have deployed to afghanistan that just afghanistan not even iraq many repeatedly uh were on multiple tours of those 2300 died there are 20,589 wounded in action according to the defense department figures make sure you listen to this next statement because you won't even believe this The U.S. government has not carried out a comprehensive accounting of how much it has spent on the war in Afghanistan, but the costs are staggering. So we don't truly know, Harry, how much we actually spent on Afghanistan. Right, because that would, you know, configure an audit. (laughs) Right. Well, every time an audit of the Pentagon happens, 9-11 happens the day after. That's coincidence. Ooh, uh, yeah, we lost $2 billion. We don't know where it went. Uh, But, oh. Plane. 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 <laughs> yep. Yeah. Did the same thing at work. Um, there was, you know, oh, no, flood. Flood. <laughs> but they do these things all the time with the Pentagon where they're like, well, we just don't know what happened to the money. It's ne- and it's never that it's lost. It's just that it got spent and they don't know. They know and kept the receipts. You know, no one's well, monitoring that stuff. But remember back in the uh, early 80s, the big – to do when they found out that they were paying $750 for a wrench and $2,000 for a toilet and things like that. That was all just funneling black money and keeping the books balanced. That's all it was saying that they've never known where all that money goes. Yeah. And you hear a little bit through these papers kind of where some of that went. So we know some of the costs though. So since 2001, the defense department, state department and us agency for 
international development here after called USAID, uh, have spent or appropriated between $934 billion and $978 billion, according to an adjusted, uh, inflation-adjusted estimate by Netta Crawford, a poli-sci professor and co-director of the Cost of War Project at Brown University. Jesus. Now, now <clears throat> these figures do not include money spent by other agencies, including the CIA and the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, we've allocated more than $133 billion to build up Afghanistan, more than it's spent adjusted for inflation to revive the whole of Western Europe with the Marshall Plan after World War II. The Marshall Plan rebuilt Europe. Uh, and then what has happened in Afghanistan? Uh, not much. Not, not building Europe, I, I can tell no. you that much. There's no Europe in Afghanistan currently. <laughs> Um, Jeffrey Eggers, a retired SEAL and White House staffer under Bush and Obama, told government interviewers, what do we get for this trillion-dollar effort? What is worth $1 trillion? After the killing of Osama bin Laden, I said that Osama was probably laughing in his watery grave considering how much we spent on Afghanistan. Now, the documents also contradict public statements from U.S. presidents, military commanders, and diplomats who assured Americans year after year that they were making progress in Afghanistan and the war was worth fighting. Several of those interviewed described the explicit and sustained efforts by the government to deliberately mislead the public. Uh, I don't think any of us are surprised that we were lied to by these guys, are you? Is there gambling going on in this establishment? I can't yeah, right. <laughs> uh, I think to libertarians, none of this is shocking. Yeah. I, I, I think is the, the shocking thing is it's like, wow, hmm. This is right, and I hope people will read this. Yeah. Oh, no one's reading this. That's what I'm shocked about. Yeah. Well, it, the thing is, is that the people who are going to be affected by this already know. The people who are going to ignore this because it comes from the, the Washington Compost, mm -hmm. they're not going to listen to it. It's just, it's all fake news. That's right. Yeah. Uh, before we move on, let's take a little bit of a break because I, for, I, I neglected to thank our patrons, and they're the ones who bring us this particular show. And uh, we want to thank you guys for being patrons. All of you are extremely important to us. And we thank everybody who uh, gives their, their money, but also time. A lot of the, our patrons are people who work on the actual program. Um, so thank you to Craig DaCosta, Christy Avery, Jason Doolittle, Jeff Bennett, Matthew Durbin, and Ed Brehob for being $100 a month patrons. And I want to say thank you to everybody that's given to our uh, logo redesign effort. I floated the idea of doing that, and many of you actually not only said, hey, I'll help, but sent cash in to, uh, so, so I want to thank everybody who has given towards that. If you'd like to help contribute, we're trying to raise $1,500 to redesign uh, all the logos associated with We Are Libertarians and the Wall Network, except the Boss Hog of Liberty, who remains the sole holdout. Uh, and so I want to thank uh, Christy Avery in a big, big way. Christy Avery gave a big chunk of money towards this. And we thank her so much. Brian Nichols, Reinhold, you, you gave, thank you so much. Uh, Mitchell Mankiewicz, thank you so much. And I'm sorry that I ruined your name. Jason Doolittle, Matthew Durbin, and Christopher Lane, thank you so much. If you give $100 or more, I'm going to send you a t-shirt that only you will get. I will not give this t-shirt to anyone else. Only you folks who donate towards this project will get that special T-shirt. So thank you. I'm even making a special patch for Matthew Durbin, who asks so nicely for his uh, vest. So thanks, everybody. If you want to give to that, it's paypal.me slash we are libertarians, paypal.me slash we are libertarians. And you can send in a contribution. No contribution is too small. Everyone is valued. And we can only progress as a platform with your support. So thank you so much. Um, so let's get back to the Afghan papers and continue talking about how our government lied. Now, there are many instances uh, in these papers, in the Afghan papers, where government officials misled us. Um, interviewees said it was common at military headquarters in Kabul in Afghanistan and at the White House to distort statistics to make it appear the U.S. was winning the war when that was not the case. And I, it should be said that the White House is the Bush administration, the Obama administration, and the Trump administration. It's not uh, that damn dishonest Donald Trump, as Reinhold might say. It was uh, specifically, a, I mean, Obama takes a real big hit in, in a lot of this. 
Uh, Bob Crowley, an American Army colonel, told interviewers, every data point, every data point was altered to present the best possible picture. Surveys, for instance, were totally unreliable, but reinforced that everything we were doing was right, and we became, an, we became a self-licking ice cream cone. All right, weird turn of phrase. Um, <laughs> but that happens all the time in bureaucracy, is everybody wants to make themselves look really good when they are turning information into their boss, especially when it comes to war, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Want everyone to think you're doing the best job. That's People right. So you're spending, you know, millions shooting tents. When your employee, James Neese, comes to you and gives you information, it's always the best information. Oh, yeah. always. Yeah. Yeah. He makes sure I always know he's the victim. You know, he's innocent. And every <laughs> argument, yeah. Every time HR calls and is like, it's about James. Oh, I'm sure he's the victim. How often does that happen? Yeah, just twice a week. <laughs> yeah, it's down the twice a week. How does uh, down? How does he have a job still? It's you know, you know, it's you know. He honestly, has pictures doesn't he? He has pictures on you. Uh, maybe. Yeah, that's what maybe I thought. Photos. Might have photos. I think many photos. <laughs> so. And, 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 and he keeps he keeps the servers moving. That's that's all yeah. that really matters, well, you know. He's an idiot savant. Yeah. And yeah also, he's, he's not spending trillions either. He's not spending trillions or millions. You know, if he was spending millions, you know. You know. I guarantee that if we had put him in charge of the war effort, we'd do, be doing a lot better. No, he we probably, probably wouldn't be there anymore. That's yeah. right. We'd be in Bangkok, dog. No, he'd yeah, have like, the entire U.S. He have the U.S. military pocket healing him in some game or playing World of Warcraft and like. Yeah, there's no hentai the, over there. We're gonna go <laughs> raid on the Chinese. Watch this. Uh, <laughs> if you don't know who James Neese is, go to wall.fireside.fm. Look his name up and just go listen to any episode with him. It's it's insane. Uh, one of the four one of the four chan founders. Um, and he's a he works for Harry. So imagine four chan <laughs> works for you. Four chan incarnate. <laughs> So uh, back to these great notes prepared by Sam Schultz, uh, our great researcher. Uh, so throughout the, it, throughout the interviews, there are torrents of criticisms that refute the official narrative of the war from its earliest days through the start of the Trump administration. Now, at the outset, the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan had a clear stated objective. Now, Reinhold, we knew, you know, 9-11 had just happened. What was the clear objective in Afghanistan? The clear objective in Afghanistan was to take the Taliban from a power so that they could no longer support people like um, the guy who did 9-11. Osama Amy bin Laden. Me. <laughs> yeah, Osama right. bin Laden. Um, he was hiding there in Tora Bora, <laughs> and they had training camps. We got to fight oh, yeah, all, so fight us here? They kept him, uh, they kept him uh, well-stocked and, and trained, even though I think a lot of it was happening in Pakistan too. But that's, that's besides the point. Um, it's Afghanistan that was the problem. So we uh, immediately went there. And it was interesting, too, because after 9-11, the feeling was we have to go get somebody. And that was the best, best case they made at the time. And nobody really um, doubted it or said anything bad about it. There were a few Democrat senators who were kind of balking at it. Mm -hmm. But they ended up saying, we're going to give George Bush one. This was a direct quote from, and I can't remember the name of the senator, but he said, we're going to give George one, but if he tries another war, we're going to stop him. Hmm. Hmm. So there was already a feeling, there was already yeah. a feeling at like 9, 13, 2001, that he was going for Iraq. There was a feeling that he was going some. he's going to go somewhere else. They didn't know where they thought maybe Iran, um, Iraq, who knows? I mean, they they just knew that he was wanting to go do this. The, the reason why they thought he was going to go to Iraq, and let me and explain this, a lot of people don't remember this, he fucked my but dad. he kind of, he ran on taking care of Saddam Hussein, finishing the job his dad started, and that's why a lot of people supported him. Is the, the country at the time was, the majority of people, I think 72% of the people were for going militarily into Iraq and taking out Saddam. This was a year before 9-11. I thought he was not a, not a nation builder. No, no. He didn't want to do a nation building, but he did want to take him from power and then let them build their own nation back up. Hmm. That, was the, that was the thought process. We wouldn't be there nation building. We wouldn't be there 
fighting, you know, their civil war that's going to ultimately happen, you know, that anybody could have seen coming a mile away. Um, that That's what he was wanting to do, though. He was wanting to get him out of power so that we could, you know, finally, you know, protect the Kurds, let the Kurds have their own place, let, let them handle it, uh, and then get out. But it didn't work out that way for some reason. Um, I don't know if it was just bad planning. It was Iran. <laughs> we got to get Iran. They're the, they're the key yeah. of the whole deal. That doesn't it's sound all... like compassionate conservatism. Remember, the, remember that? Remember well, compassionate conservatism? I do remember. Well, I have a button up on, on my button uh, back here. It says, I'm a compassionate conservatism. I got that in 2003 at CPAC. Yeah, well, the neocons will say a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Neo, the neocons said they want to limit uh, spending. Yeah, that's, that's working. That's working real well. Right, Holes is like, lies I've been told. <laughs> yeah. Lies I've been told. <laughs> it's, wor- yeah, it's worse than, you know, a high school girlfriend. You told so many lies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so as the war goes on, everybody starts to see a reason why we ought to be there, and you get mission creep, the very definition. So some U.S. officials wanted to use the war to turn Afghanistan into democracy. Uh, others wanted to transform Afghan culture and elevate women's rights. And others wanted to reshape the regional balance of power among Pakistan, India, Iran, and Russia. An unidentified U.S. official told interviewers in 2015 with AFPAC strategy, Afghanistan and Pakistan, there were present, there was present under the Christmas tree, there was a present under the Christmas tree for everyone. By the time you were finished, you had so many priorities and aspirations, it was like it had no strategy at all there. Now, the lessons learned interviews also showed how military commanders struggled to articulate who they were fighting and why. In the field, the U.S. troops couldn't tell friends from the enemy. Uh, now, I watched on the plane to or from San Francisco the movie Cheney, or no, it was uh, Vice. Yeah, Vice. It was Adam McKay's attempt at uh, Oliver Stone type movie about the evil Dick Cheney. Mm-hmm. Uh, listen, I, 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 I hate to recommend it. It was brilliantly told in the way that it, it showed the unified executive theory and the, the uh, consolidation of power under Cheney. Some of that was great, but like the portrayal of Bush was just laughable. So there, there's a lot in it that is just pure propaganda. Uh, so just know that it has a very clear bias against Dick Cheney and, and wasn't trying to be fair towards anyone in the Bush administration. Um, but it did uh, did show the, the the focus groups by Frank Luntz and, and say, you know, we can't figure out who we're fighting. We're not fighting uh, Afghanistan because we're partnering with the Northern Alliance. Who are we fighting? So they come up with a war on terror, uh, which, which worked. Uh, so that was an interesting scene to kind of show how they came up with that. Who knows if that actually happened? Uh, but that's why the war on terror was coined, apparently, according to this uh, biased movie. Um, so the and truth, the, they came up with the axis of evil too. Yeah, it, it, uh, Iraq, Iran, and North Korea. Yep. So uh, one one person says, um, "Was Al Qaeda the enemy or the Taliban? Was Pakistan a friend or an adversary?" What about the Islamic State and the bewildering array of foreign jihadists, let alone the warlords on the CIA's payroll? According to the documents, the U.S. government never settled an answer. An unnamed former advisor to Army Special Forces team told interviewers in 2017, quote, they thought I was going to come to them with a map to show them where the good guys and the bad guys live. It took several conversations for them to understand that I did not have that information in my hands. At first, they just kept asking, But who are the bad guys and where are they? In a 2003 memo, Donald Rumsfeld wrote, I have no visibility into who the bad guys are. We are woefully deficient in human intelligence. And part of the problem is that the Americans couldn't get human intelligence. They couldn't trust anybody. As you'll see in our police forces that we hired, it was a lot of Taliban. Uh, And so, you know, if uh, just like in Iraq in our last episode, when Shia, Iranian Shia come in to talk to Shia militiamen in Iraq 
they're going to go with the Shia militiamen from Iran and not the American soldier who doesn't speak their language or understand their culture and may sometimes not even be very friendly to them uh, or maybe downright arrogant. So um, one great movie, uh, it's got Brad Pitt in it. It's on Netflix. Um, man, it's War Machine. Have either of you seen War Machine? Mm -mm. Okay. It's, Is it that Marvel movie? With the no. Black guy? It's, it's uh, Brad Pitt plays essentially Stanley McChrystal. And so Michael Hastings was a Rolling Stone journalist who went to Afghanistan while Obama was president. And Stanley McChrystal was in charge of Afghanistan at the time. And he made some uh, unsavory comments about how there was no plan in Afghanistan and Obama was kind of fucking up. And uh, basically Hastings wrote it down and reported it and McChrystal got fired. But it shows so brilliantly why Afghanistan never worked and what a revolving door it was and how the Americans were wasting lives, time, and money mm -hmm. and how the Afghans were playing us and how we couldn't ingratiate ourselves to the local population. That is a really well-done movie uh, that shows you exactly kind of what, what, it, what it was like by – I was not there, but by all accounts, kind of what, what happened and based on reporting. So – um, so check that out, War Machine on Netflix. Oh, yeah, it's on Netflix, adding it to my list. Yeah, it's really, really well done. Uh, Brad Pitt is hilarious in it. Um, so as commanders-in-chief, Bush, Obama, and Trump all promised the public the same thing. They would avoid falling into the trap of nation-building in Afghanistan. Quote, our policy was to create a strong central government, which was idiotic because Afghanistan does not have a history of a strong central government. The time frame for creating a strong central government is 100 years, which we don't have, told an unidentified former State Department official to interviewers in 2015. One unnamed executive with you said, guessed that 90% of what they spent was overkill. We lost objectivity, he said. We were given money, told to spend it, and we did, without reason. One unidentified contractor told government interviewers that he expected to dole out $3 million daily for projects in a single Afghan district, roughly the size of a United States county. He once asked a visiting congressman whether the lawmaker could reasonably spend that kind of money back home. He said, hell no. Well, sir, that's what you have just obligated us to spend, and I'm doing it for communities that live in mud huts with no windows. Mm. I found that to be an extraordinary fact that we're spending $3 million daily in a place the size of a United States county. How, how, how well, you know, if we spent $3 million daily here in uh, Indianapolis, could you imagine what we could do in this we, county? We would only just have the red line. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, like we spent, we built this cultural trail, which is a giant sidewalk here in Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, you know, and that was only $10 million. Mm -hmm. I mean, only, but, you know, in the grand scheme of the federal budget, $10 million is not that much. Right. You know, and that was a five-year project. <laughs> $3 million a day. I mean, $3 million a day in uh, the county that Reinhold lives in, mm -hmm. it might actually have a city or a McDonald's at some point. Maybe <laughs> a stoplight would be great. You'd still, you'd, they'd still be living in mud huts with no windows, but... Please. As long as they don't get rid of the cows and sheep and horses yeah. and everything else. They can't get rid of fine. the girlfriends. <laughs> but you have something to take to the dance on Saturday night, you know what I'm saying? Right. <laughs> he lives in a rural western county of Indiana. But there was a uh, reason. I mean, they didn't know what was going on in Afghanistan. And the problem, the problem is, is that they just kind of thought it was going to be like any other country. You know, the Taliban yeah. was in control. That's what they were told. The Taliban was in control. But the Taliban is just a bunch of warlords jockeying for position and constantly changing. There's other warlords that are stepping up and coming down, and it's constant bickering and infighting all over the place. Is there's no centralized, as you said, there's no centralized um, organization to any of it. So who, you could be dealing with one person one day, and they could flip on you and sell you off to someone else the next day, and you would never know it. Uh, and they're doing it just for a buck. And if you got three million a day floating around in there. Yeah, just what, in one little think, area. How powerful? They're, they're all going to take it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. How powerful is the person doling out the three million dollars a day, especially the Afghan with that kind of backing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What you what guess guess what happened? 
Uh, there might have been a little corruption. A little corruption is a little, a little bit, just a little. Yeah, yeah, just teeny little bit. Needy. So, yeah. We essentially, because we allowed this corruption to happen, because you had so much money flowing through the hands of Afghan officials, they started doling it out to friends, and anybody who was seen as a an American backed official was seen as corrupt. And so we ended up destroying the legitimacy early on of the government that we were trying to, uh, to, to help prop up. Um, they were, you know, judges, police chiefs, bureaucrats, they were all extorting bribes. Many Afghans soured on democracy and turned to the Taliban to enforce order. Because once you lose legitimacy as a government, disorder takes place and people don't obey the, there you go, the key word, obey the commands of the judges. And so you, you lost order in a place like Afghanistan. And so if your government, if your goal is to build a, a top-down centralized government, mm -hmm. then you need everybody to buy into that concept. Well, that didn't happen there. You know, we're, we're sheep here. We're, we look at those, oh, look at those backward hillbillies who just disobeyed their strong centralized government. We're so, we're so metropolitan, <laughs> cosmopolitan compared to them. Oh, I bet they ride camels to work. <laughs> Meanwhile, yes, what should I do, Daddy Trump? Okay. Uh, so, uh, one official told interviewers, our biggest single project, sadly and inadvertently, of course, may have been the development of mass corruption. Once it gets to the level, I say, when I was out there, it's somewhere between unbelievably hard and outright impossible to fix it. So, you see that in, in War Machine as well, that it just became absolutely, um, you couldn't, you cannot fix the problem in Afghanistan at this point. It, the, the corruption is too much. The government money floating there, the American money is still too high. Uh, and it's just impossible. Mm. So now what we've been told by our generals, though, is that we're making steady progress on the central goal of the strategy, which is the official strategy is to train the Afghan army and national police force that can defend the country without foreign help. And we've been told, you know, we have to stay there because if we leave now, then it's going to collapse and the Afghans, uh, the Taliban will rush in. It'll just go right back to where it was. So we need to keep pumping money into this. Uh, that, that sounds familiar. I'm trying to remember where I've heard that before. Uh, um, Iraq? Uh, nine, uh, tw uh, 2000, 2003, Iraq. Detroit? Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah Detroit, Clash for Clunkers. That's it. Uh, yeah. It is amazing, Harry, how often this fucking line, if you don't do what we say and give us your money, everything's going to go to hell. And you're like, oh, no, oh, no. Things, things might get bad in Afghanistan. I don't like hell. We don't want that. Ish. The world will go crazy if something were to, go, were to happen. Right. You can't prove a negative. You can't, you know, mm -hmm. we could pull out and nothing might happen. I mean, listen, sometimes you pull out, something happens. Some more often than not, you pull out and nothing happens, right? Right. I mean, you just, yeah. it's, it's, you know, 80% effective. Yeah. I've, I've heard 99. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So in the lesson learned interview, however, U.S. military trainers described the Afghan security forces as un basically the staff of We Are Libertarians, incompetent unmotivated and rife with deserters <laughs> hey, we can get three million dollars a day guys oh yeah they, let's go get that done if you don't get do it then we're going to cause problems we might meme you <laughs> they also accused afghan commanders of pocketing salaries paid by u.s taxpayers for tens of thousands of ghost soldiers and not the kind uh in the white walker brigade but uh, fake names on the rolls more than 60,000 members of afghan security forces have been killed one unidentified soldier with the special forces teams, quote, hated the Afghan police that he worked with, calling them, quote, awful. Again, a description of uh, our team. Awful. The bottom of the barrel in the podcast that is already the bottom of the barrel. A U.S. military officer estimated that one third of the police recruits were drug addicts or Taliban, <laughs> which is the description of Lions of Liberty. Uh, <laughs> trust me one third of lions of liberty are drug addicts or taliban uh, <laughs> thinking we could build the military that fast and that well was insane said one senior unnamed you said official they told interviewers 
Um, now, maybe why they didn't name these particular people, I have not seen why these are unnamed sources, mm -hmm. but my educated guess is the reason they're not naming them is that these interviews were given to government officials under the understanding that these would never be released to the public. And so you have 600 people who work for the government, who are talking to the government about the government freely without consequence saying, oh, this will never be leaked. This will never be out in public. It's sealed. You can say what you want. It'll never be used against you. And so it's possible. Again, I don't know. I'm just guessing with an educated guess that the Washington Post said it's not necessarily important who said this. It may be more important that we know what they said without those people. It may be technically unethical to out those people when they thought when they were saying this off the record. Does that sound reasonable to you too? Is that a you know if that were the explanation, would you be satisfied with that? Oh yeah, these people definitely need the protection of that anonymity. This way, you know, hopefully we can hear more of this crap. Are you being sarcastic? That sounded like your sarcastic voice. It's kind of half there because one, you know, even if we did know who did say this, you know, they go do crap. We've had whistleblowers be uh, before said stuff. No one cares. It's just kind of now right. just, you know, you know, so the idea of uh, allowing people to put things in reports so we can hear about it. Psh, thanks. Thanks. Well, you got to understand too, probably a lot of these people are still working in the military, still probably holding very high level jobs mm -hmm. in the military. And it could be pretty ugly if that if those names were to be floated out there saying this stuff too, uh, especially to their careers because there's a UCMJ, mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, the military justice codes are going to just tear them apart for saying stuff like that. I mean, they're they not supposed to talk to like that. Could they go to jail? They, well, they could go to big boy military jail. Oh, yeah. Nobody nobody wants to go to Leavenworth. Right. Or Gitmo. Right. Whoa, 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 Gitmo doesn't exist. <laughs> I made an Abu Ghraib joke on the Pat Down Life podcast, and nobody mm -hmm. knew what I was talking about except for like three isn't, people. Isn't that bad? Isn't that funny? It's terrible. Oh, you no, know, yeah. I, learned, I learned last night as I was watching one of the uh, many, many, many documentaries that I watch on YouTube or online or whatever. I was watching Dan Snow taking a 360 tour of the Tower of London. Uh, it was like a 45 minute tour. Visually was not spectacular, but great information. Did you know that only 48 cases of torture were ever recorded in the Tower of London and only six people were executed? Which means that in the most famous torture palace in Europe, George Bush, Dick Cheney, and Abu Ghraib may be responsible for more torture than the Tower of London in all of its thousand-year history. Uh, That's guaranteed. Oh, come uh, on. If you just limit to, to Abu Ghraib, maybe. But, I mean, if all the stuff that they the black authorized... Side. Yeah. Yeah. It just it's crazy what they what they got away with. What are you siding with the the limey Brits, Harry? All I'm saying is <laughs> it's the Tower of London. There's no one, you know, it's different. You know, you, I think you have to put their torture, you know, put inflation into it, you know, to get accurate numbers. There's, like a, there's like not, a per capita. It's not, it's not money. There's no inflation <laughs> on torture. Yeah, but look but look at the, you know, look at how the French did it. I mean, the, the terror and oh, the, oh. the heads that they were chopping off, thousands of, yeah, I mean, so, they, they took care of it. So, so Britain's numbers were just, they need to get those rookie numbers up. Those are rookies, no, yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing about London, Britain is, you know, we think of medieval times as like horribly barbaric, but because of the common law, England wasn't as barbaric as you might think. Yep. And so when King Henry VIII decided to divorce his wife for Anne Boleyn, and then decided to execute Anne Boleyn. That was an extremely big deal. It was all very unheard of mm -hmm. and very, out, like, it, it, you didn't have, like, that's why there's the terrible King John and there's, you know, the, the King Henry is so, like, vilified, like, because there are only several kings who are actually horribly, horribly, like, evil you know, di dictator type kings in the history of Europe. Uh, and they're usually removed and usually dealt with by the nobles. You had a very strong noble system. And so the Tower of London's, like, torture and executions all kind of took time around the 1500s or with, 
with King Henry VIII. And so when he went to kill and execute Anne Boleyn, they had to bring in a French executioner because he asked her, how would you like to die? And she said, I don't want my head on the block with the ax. So few executions took place in London that it would take multiple chops of the head to get the head off with the ax on the block. Mm -hmm. But the French were so good at executing people that they had paid executioners. And so Henry brought one of those in to take Anne Boleyn's head off clean. And there's, there were only six executions. Now, the Tower of London... Damn frogs. You had to pay for your prison. So, like, if you went to prison, you paid to go. And so the people who were locked up in the Tower of London could afford to be in those luxurious... Like, it was like a nice apartment. And so that's why there were only six deaths, because those people were usually, like, really big up high up in society. Mm -hmm. um, but there were 1,500 graves on the actual uh, location. But... There's your total diversion. But I just thought that was fascinating that during Iraq, we probably tortured in Abu Ghraib more people than all of the Tower of London. That's Maybe only interesting to me. I don't know. No, it's freaking – it's it, it's insane yeah. what it is. was what it is. It's like – Well, it's what we put, what we put, her, yeah, what we put up with here. Right. Exactly. Um, all right. So I, let's, let's, go ahead. I'll just say I remember when – you know, we were talking about going into Iraq to begin with. There was people protesting. There were millions of people out there, you know, doing protests. Code Pink was disrupting a lot of stuff. It was, people were upset. And we just beat that out of the society over the past decade and a half. Mm -hmm. That now nobody says a word. And, you know, part of it's because Obama, you know, was a Democrat. He was doing the same thing. So it was kind of, you can't say anything now if you're a Democrat like you did before. But it, yeah. it's also just, I think people just got tired and said, whatever. I'm, we can't fight this. We're just done. We're going to go on with our lives. And, and one day, hopefully, this will all work out. Well, let's talk about our buddy Obama and what a great guy he was. <laughs> A person identified only as a senior National Security Council official said there was constant pressure from the Obama White House and Pentagon to produce figures to show the troop surge of 09 to 11 was working, despite hard evidence to the contrary. Quote, it was impossible to create good metrics. We tried using troop numbers, trained, violence levels, control of territory, and none of it painted an accurate picture. The metrics were always manipulated for the duration of the war. Suicide bombings in Kabul were portrayed as a sign of the Taliban's desperation, that the insurgents were too weak to engage in direct combat. A rise in U.S. troop deaths was cited as proof that American forces were taking the fight to the enemy. The National Security Council official told interviewers, it was their explanations. For example, attacks are getting worse. That's because there are more targets for them to fire at, so more attacks are a false indicator of instability. Then, three months later, attacks are still getting worse. It's because the Taliban are getting desperate, so it's actually an indicator that we're winning. Doesn't that sound like Donald Trump? Yes. Yeah. This, and, is, what and, I'm, this is what I'm always saying about the Trump administration. <laughs> Everybody gets so pissed off at him, but if you pay attention... Donald Trump is just your typical politician. His administration and his presidency and his people and himself do everything that all these guys do. And 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 a little bit more. No, he just says and, it and no, quick. and a little bit more. But he says he does all the same stuff. Yeah. I mean, he's he's a he's a liberal Democrat. I mean, he's no different than Obama, really. I mean, uh, what I found interesting too is one thing that keeps getting lost in all this is that how many civilians we've killed over there oh, yes. uh, in, in just a human toll. And you can't get the numbers on the civilians because what they did was they redesignated re, re the term enemy combatant to be any male over the age of 14. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you kill a bunch of people that had nothing to do with anything at a wedding. Mm -hmm. You know, if they were male and over 14, they were an enemy combatant. They don't count against the civilians killed. So here are some of those numbers. Since 2001, an estimated 157,000 people have been killed in the war in Afghanistan. 157,000 in Afghanistan. I think it's over a million in, in Iraq, isn't it? What? The Deaths. 
Yeah. Iraq. I think just well, Iraqis. Just just Iraqis, if you, not counting the sanctions before those too. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so, and we here at We Are Libertarians consider sanctions an act of war. Mm -hmm. uh, tune into last week to hear why uh, on Iran. Uh, so six out of the 157,000, 64,124 Afghan security forces, 43,074 Afghan civilians. So 43,000 civilians, second highest category of death, 42,000 Taliban fighters and other insurgents. 300, so... 64,000 Afghan security forces, 43,000 Afghan civilians, 42,000 Taliban fighters, 3,800 U.S. contractors, 2,300 U.S. military persons, 1,145 NATO and coalition troops, 424 humanitarian aid workers, 67 journalists and media workers. Uh, to finish out this little part, Bob Crowley, a retired Army colonel who we started with, told interviewers that the, quote, truth was rarely welcome at military headquarters in Kabul. Bad news is often stifled. There was more freedom to share bad news if it was small. We're running over kids with our MRAPs, for example, because those things could be changed with policy directives. But when we tried to air larger strategic concerns about the willingness, capacity, or corruption of the Afghan government, it was clear it wasn't welcome. Uh, so, not surprising to me that uh, we found out this particular information, that the mission involved, there was no defined mission, we wasted a tremendous amount of money, and that nobody wanted to tell us the truth, nobody wanted to tell the American people the truth, the people in power wanted to maintain their power by lying to us. And worse is that it's actually worse now. We've got more bombings now than we had before. We got more civilian deaths. We're killing more civilians now than the Taliban did. Really? Uh, in two th 2018, we killed more civilians than the Taliban did in 2018. Um, it, it's just like, when is this going to stop? How rubbleized do we need this country to be in order to uh, finally say we're done? And it's not like they're, we're even there for oil. They don't right. really. I, that, that, I, think, I think I read somewhere that Afghanistan has cobalt, which is how we use our cell phones. And so Russia and America are fighting in Afghanistan for cobalt. And it's like a very small, it's like one strip mine or something crazy. Yeah. And, and also look how much money uh, certain industries make every time we drop all those bombs. Right. You increase the, the number of drop, uh, Bob drop, dropped bombs. Uh, you have to go buy some more from from the guy down at the that the store who's got them, right? Yeah. The so he's going to get more money. But yeah, it's so you got the 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 cobalt there. Then there's also the poppy fields. But other than that, yeah, Reynolds right. It's all about the bombs, and then it's the bombs. You know, it's. But right, I'll go back to your point. Like, is that? The is that death to rising? Is that from just from just actual engagement or just from drone strikes because of the double tap drone strike policy? Um, you mean the civilian deaths, or do yes. you mean the number? So yeah, no. we're just dropping more bombs and we're dropping them more indiscriminately. Uh, we're just not caring who we we uh, hit. We we're using even faultier in, uh, in, intel than we had originally at the beginning of the war, right? So we're just dropping bombs. Turns out that's a wedding. You know, I mean, how many how many times have you heard that we bombed a wedding? It's not been a one time thing. Unless this, Meghan Markle's wedding was bombed, we're not hearing about it. I know. So uh, it could, it just starts becoming like the same thing every week, and you just don't you just tune it out. That's what a lot of people have done is they can't they can't really comprehend it or hold it in uh, because they know there's nothing they can really do about it. So I think a lot of people just tune it out so that they are isolated and insulated from that that's just over there that's those people right mm -hmm. uh, but those are people i mean that's the yes. ir irritating thing is that they're human beings and they're trying to just live their lives just like you are mm -hmm. uh they just were unlucky to, to be born in the wrong place of the globe and we're bombing them when they're having a celebration of getting married 
it's it just seems yeah. strange to me that the vast majority of that hundred and fifty thousand seven thousand it's not that our soldiers are contractors humanitarian aid workers it's not that they don't matter it's the the vast majority of the cost of this war in terms of lives came from afghans mm -hmm. you know it it's we view their lives as indiscriminate as as unimportant you know we we honor at the beginning of every football game, those 2,300 U.S. military personnel. But we never give a second thought to the 43,000 Afghan civilians that got killed. Well, it's their fault for being in the way of the bomb. Oh, and another thing is that 43,000 number is low, as I said before, because they were mis you know, miscounting what a civilian was. So we know it was a lot larger than that. Yeah, you're telling me that 42,000 Taliban in the country and 43,000 civilians got killed, like... It seems like a lot of Taliban and not a lot of civilians in, in that particular number. Uh, but let's talk about the media's complicit nature in all of this. Joshua Cho wrote a, a great piece for FAIR, uh, F-A-I-R, examining what the Afghan papers say about the Washington Post and other media outlets. Cho wrote, if the Post is now publishing material demonstrating that U.S. officials have been following the same talking points for 18 years, emphasizing how they are making progress, especially when the war is going badly, shouldn't the paper acknowledge that it has been cheerleading this same line for all of the, those 18 years? Doesn't it have a responsibility to examine how it served as a primary vehicle for those officials to spread the same talking points to spend the coverage in the desired fashion? A fair survey of the Washington Post op-ed pages for three weeks following 9-11 found that columns calling for or assuming a military response to the attacks were given the majority of space, while opinions urging diplomatic approaches were nearly non-existent. Eight years later, Fair found that the Washington Post coverage didn't change much from 2001, as seven out of nine op-eds and four out of five editorials supported the some kind of military escalation from the day Obama was elected through March 1st, 2009, as talks of a military surge escalated. Another study found the first 10 months of the Washington Post opinion columns that same year found that pro-war columns outnumbered anti-war columns by more than 10 to 1. Of 67 columns on the U.S. military policy in Afghanistan, 61 supported a continuing war while just six expressed anti-war views. Joshua Cho continued to write, the Post offered this lopsided coverage even when there were several polls at the time showing a majority of the U.S. public opposed the war because they believed the Afghan war was not worth fighting. The Post also has a history of facilitating official spin for the war. When WikiLeaks posted tens of thousands of classified intelligence documents related to the Afghan war, Fair found that the Post either dismissed them as not being as important as the Pentagon Papers or absurdly spun the leaks as good news for the U.S. war effort because the release could compel President Obama to explain more forcefully the war's importance. The Post also buried attempts by whistleblowers and other journalists who were working to expose official lies and war crimes in Afghanistan. When U.S. Uh, Army whistleblower Chelsea Manning was sentenced to serve 35 years in prison for sharing intelligence documents that first exposed what the Afghan papers are now corroborating. The Post, along with other corporate, corporate outlets, largely neglected Manning's legal trials and punishment. Political cartoonist and journalist Ted Rawl wrote, quote, the Afghan papers is a bright shining lie by omission. Yes, our military and civilian leaders lied to us about Afghanistan but they could never have spread their murderous BS. Thousands of U.S. soldiers and tens of Afga thousands of Afghans killed, trillions of dollars wasted, without media organizations like the Washington Post, which served as unquestioning government stenographers. Press outlets like the Post and the New York Times weren't merely idiots used to disseminate pro-war propaganda. They actively censored people who knew we should never have gone into Afghanistan and tried to tell the American voters the truth. Uh, I think that 61 to 6 number on op-eds is absolutely stunning. It is. and I mean, it's op-eds, so it's not the news. But that's still, I mean, so the 
the biases that that the papers have has always been uh, that they're going to go after the people who are in office that's against their kind of political view a little harder than they do somebody who's kind of on their side, right? So it's kind of really always been that way. I mean, the Post and Times went after Nixon hard, and Nixon just, you know, reacted to it pretty badly. Um, but they didn't go after Kennedy nearly as bad. I mean, Kennedy did a lot of stuff that never got reported because the people who we expected to report on it, the Times and the Post and that sort of thing, they were kind of letting it go by the side. But yeah. Nixon, now we got to go after Nixon. So there's always that. So when I, whenever somebody's in power, or some one party or another is in power, I usually tend to give a little more credence to the other side uh, when they start coming up with stuff. I know that they're going to be just trying to attack every little thing, but that's really what I want is I want them attacking and looking into every little thing and then I can decide whether or not they're overblowing it or not. Um, so when Obama was in office, there was a lot more on the right that I was watching and listening to and getting a lot of information about what was going on in the White House because you weren't getting it from the left. And it's the same thing when, when Trump gets in office. Now we, we fought. So you just you kind of have to – you can't get locked into this, well, the New York Times is always bad and the uh, uh, National Review is always good or something like that. You've got to know where they're coming from uh, depending on who's in power and how they're saying it and – examine what the real truth is among all of that. And it's a hard thing to do. A lot of people don't want to spend the time and effort to do that, or they're not trained to do it, or we don't teach kids how to think in school anymore. We just teach them how to recite numbers and, and um, pass tests. That's all we're really teaching. We're not teaching them how to critically thinking about things. Yeah. So until we do that, the press is just going to be able to get away with being the the propaganda arm of whoever they want to be the propaganda arm of honey yeah that, that's that's well, see the thing is is that there's a, still a lot of reporters i think that are in it for the right reasons and want to do the right thing and they want to follow those journalistic and te- the journalist integrity thing but the money does come in and then you get the editors and the people running the place who say we need to go this way we need to go that way like the like the guy at cnn says we're going to do a lot more in, uh, on trump because that's what makes us the money it wasn't because they hated Trump, even though they probably hate Trump, but it's where the money was. Yeah, uh, That was all business decisions. And I, I know you know about that. And it's, it's just kind of frustrating because I would love to see at the end of all this, people finally come to the conclusion that we need to start standing up to the government more. Um, like we, like we kind of started to do around 2003 when people were protesting and we were getting in their faces uh, 1968. Look at the protests and 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 what was going on at the time um, against the government with the Vietnam and everything else that was going on. That was that was powerful. That convinced the government to change some of the things they were doing because of the pressure that they were getting from the people. And the people now are just not giving any pressure at all to the government. Just letting them do whatever they want to in the in the in the guise of patriotism uh, because we're in the middle of a, of a war. Well. We shouldn't be. We shouldn't have been for the past decade. We shouldn't have probably been for the past two decades. And my rant is ended. <laughs> Harry, we while you were gone um, playing with your waifu, mm-hmm. we mentioned Chelsea Manning. How? Uh, what was the quote from the article? Um, when U.S. Army whistleblower Chelsea Manning was sentenced to serve 35 years in prison for sharing intelligence documents that first exposed what the Afghan papers are now corroborating, mm-hmm. the Post, along with other corporate outlets, largely neglected Manning's legal trials and punishment. Um, how does that strike you? Convenient uh, for them because of the fact that, like I said, like Chelsea's back in jail currently right now. Like everyone thinks she she's out. No, she's yeah, still in there. Yeah, her sentence was commuted, but she's still there. Well, you don't think she got out. The reason why she's back in prison right now is because they brought her back and forth court to basically testify again against herself. And so she's being held on contempt of court until she rats on more people. Hmm. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a very like complicated, like screwed, like screwed up what's going on with Chelsea. And it sucked that she, she's just there. She's not doing anything because, you know, they want information from her and she won't give it to it. Well, that's the crazy thing about all this is like Edward Snowden reveals all this information Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's in the public interest for us to know because the press won't actually cover it. 
pre right. press members knew about Prism allegedly and never reported on it. You know, Chelsea Manning leaks this information. Uh, the Washington Post gets celebrated, but you know, Daniels Ellsberg and Chelsea Manning, they're the, they're the heels. Like they're, and, and I think part of it is just because they're the convenient, the, the government can then point at that individual and it's easy to make them look unpatriotic for doing that. Right. Yeah. They're the, it's easy to make them another. That's why I said, like, I think it's uh, uh, great that they could put this report out, you know, anonymously because, you know, other than that, no one's willing to speak on it because they see what like, well, you saw granted like Chelsea and, um, uh, Edward Snowden didn't go through quote unquote the proper channels to get the information out, but you know, information really doesn't get out or hit people with the side of weight that basically Edward Snowden did. You Does know. it sound like it, through all of this that any of the right information could get out? <laughs> That's the thing is like to me, like the right information's out is just for it takes people to actually take it, digest it, see what they're doing, and, and want to act upon it. But it seems like they don't. That's not what they want yeah. to act upon. Well, then, like I said, it, it's it's out there. You can find it. It's just, do you trust the source it's coming from? And a lot of people are putting themselves in the little echo chambers to say, mm -hmm. I trust this source. I don't trust that source. So not, anything that that source says, I'm not going to believe. And anything this source says, I'll believe. Then you get into the position where you're not getting all of this information that you're supposed to get. There's times I've been arguing with people about something that's going on, something that I'm presenting the facts. I'm showing the links. I'm like, this is this, this, this is going on. And he's like, well, that's not what I heard. That's fake news. They won't even look at it. Hmm. It's just like, nobody wants to hear it anymore. They just want their side to win. I, I saw after Iran, I saw one conservative tweet out, which was hilarious because they're the first snowflakes to fall when it comes to, you know, the press is doing this, the press is doing that. The guy basically said, don't trust anything that hasn't been verified by a government source. But that, that's the attitude of a lot of American citizens and a lot of the press. Like, unless a government official says it, it's not really news for a lot of these people. Uh, so it, it's, you know, unless they get a government source verifying it, really usually but, do. Was that, this a person who was just the week before yelling about the deep state? Eh, this was some college conservative kid. So this person that isn't a full thinker yet. Okay. Uh, he's not done yet. Uh, a couple book recommendations. Uh, we're trying to expand your knowledge. You want to look into these books uh, on media and its relation to war and propaganda. First is Manufacturing Consent by Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky. And uh, they break it down. Uh, what was that, Harry? Noam Chomsky. We've interviewed Noam Chomsky here on We Are Libertarians. You can go back in the in this podcast, mm -hmm. this very podcast feed, and find our interview. I have his uh, office number if we ever want to call him up. But uh, very interesting interview that we did on a podcast series called The Show Report, where we break down media and, and uh, lasted nine whole episodes uh, with Ryan Ripley and Joe Ruiz way back in 2013. But we interviewed Ron Paul and Noam Chomsky. Uh, so what they do is they, uh, based on a series of case studies, including the media's dichotomous treatment of worthy versus unworthy victims, legitimizing and meaningless third world elections, and devastating critiques of media coverage of the U.S. wars against Indochina, Herman and Chomsky draw on decades of criticism to research and to propose a propaganda model to explain the media's behavior and performance. So it uh, talks a lot about various agreements and reporting about foreign, and, and it really gives you a good framework of how the modern media propagandizes things in favor of the government. The second book that I'll recommend is Weapons of Mass Deception. Uh, it is by John Stauber and Sheldon Rampton, who worked for the Center for Media and Democracy. Uh, this book was published a long time ago. It's not a comic book, even though it's got some comic uh, characters of Saddam, Osama, and Bush on the cover. Uh, but I started it on the plane, and I mean, I wanted to highlight the first like three pages. Uh, and it and it talks about in Iraq when you remember the great moment of Liberation Day, April 9th, two thousand three, in Baghdad. We roll in, and then there's the toppling of the giant Saddam Hussein. 
You oh, guys yeah. remember that image? I remember that really well. Describe the image of the toppling of that Saddam statue to me. What do you remember? I, I remember them. Well, the, the, there was a funny thing where they were starting to put flags on the face of Saddam when they were getting ready to tear it down. And somebody put an American flag on it, and they quickly ripped it away because they knew that that was going to be a uh, terrible message to send. Yeah, the, uh, the Iraqis actually ripped that down and put up an yeah. Iraqi flag, yeah. Right, and they put an Iraqi flag up, and then they toppled it. And I, I just remember it was a feeling of, um, e even to me at the time, was like a success, uh, victory. Uh, we, we've gotten rid of this horrible person out of power. He's still, a, you know... Uh, at the time, he was still alive, and we were we were kind of trying to catch him. But uh, it's it seemed like maybe there was hope for the region. Yeah, I was Donald naive Rumsfeld, at the time. <laughs> right, Donald Rumsfeld likened it to the falling of the Berlin Wall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Saddam Hussein is now taking his rightful place along Hitler, Stalin, Lenin, and Casco in the pantheon of failed brutal dictators, and the Iraqi people are well on their way to freedom. And Tom Brokaw compared these the event to quote all the statues of Lenin that came down across the Soviet Union. The Washington Post reported Iraqis celebrate in Baghdad. Jubilant Iraqi swarms the streets of capital, said the headline in the New York Times. The Boston Globe proclaimed it was Liberation Day in Baghdad. USA Today ran a photo of the event on the front page accompanied by an interview with Private Chen's sister. It's just amazing. We're so proud of him. David Asman on Fox News said, if you don't have goosebumps now, you never will in your life. Uh, now, how many people do you remember being in that particular crowd? I mean, it looked pretty big, didn't it? It looked to be a couple hundred people to me. And I, I, I kind of know a little bit of the story after the fact. All right, then shut up. But, <laughs> but there, was, <laughs> there was a few hundred people. I mean, it wasn't like you had the feeling that there were probably like 1,000, 1,500 people right. there, but. It still so, wasn't – it was a small area. It was a small closing area. Yeah, the book reports that it was less than 200 people, but every shot by the BBC photo photographers, the mm -hmm. TV stations, it was up close, and it was made it look like an enormous crowd. Mm -hmm. uh, what you didn't hear about were the uh, night demonstrations, the anti-American demonstrations nine days later when thousands of Iraqis took to the streets – of Baghdad calling for U.S. led forces to leave the city, yeah. um, which so, we should have done. <laughs> yeah, at that moment. Exactly right. Uh, so they they go on to talk about this guy named John W. Rendon, uh, who was a PR person. Uh, he was a PR consultant, and he worked extensively on Iraq related projects. Uh, and on February 29, nineteen ninety six, before an audience of cadets at the U.S. Air Force Academy. He said, I'm not a national security strategist or a military technician, Rendon said. I'm a politician and a person who uses communication to meet public policy or corporate policy objectives. In fact, I'm an inform information warrior and a perception manager. He reminded the Air Force cadets that when the victorious troops rolled into Kuwait City at the end of the first war in the Persian Gulf, they were greeted by hundreds of Kuwaitis waving small American flags. The scene flashed around the world on television screens, sent the message that U.S. Marines were being welcomed in Kuwait as liberating heroes. Mm -hmm. Did you ever stop to wonder, Rendon asked, how the how people of Kuwait City, after being held hostage for seven long, painful months, were able to get handheld American, and for that matter, the flags of other coalition countries? He paused for effect. Well, now you know the answer. That was one of my jobs. Uh, so question everything that you see on the television. When a plane gets shot down, I literally said, I'm not going to believe this until I see the missile hit the actual plane. Lo and behold, there is video of the missile hitting the, the plane, the Ukrainian plane in, in Iran. Mm -hmm. I still yeah. have to wonder, how was that particular phone aimed at that particular spot in the middle of the night? <laughs> right. Seemingly not filming anything else, not zooming around, just fixated on the exact right location in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm not saying that it's a, f a false flag. I'm not saying it's a conspiracy. I just have learned after reading books like this and watching mm -hmm. this for so long and now reading things like the Afghan papers 
to question literally everything that you see or hear from the United States government, the Iraqi government, the Iranian government, the British government, and the Washington Post and the New York Times. Verify every single fact. Yes. Yes. So, I mean, Reinhold, you were, were you in the first Gulf War? No, I was not. Uh, my military experience was in the mid eighties. Korean, right? The Korean War. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I never actually got. Uh, I never. We were kind of at a peacetime. At Believe the time. it or not, Harry Reinhold was responsible for funneling the weapons to the Contras. Knew it. Best friends with Oliver North. <laughs> well, Oliver North took the rap for everybody. We have to give him props. Mm. Here is a little known fact about the We Are Libertarian Studios. Little neocon Chris Spangle goes to CPAC 2003. He buys here. Let me turn it on to the, I'll, I'll turn on the, the camera to the apartment. I'll break the illusion. Oh. Uh, you see in the background, those three photos in the back, there's the beautiful mm -hmm. shots of Washington, DC. And the middle one is the Iwo Jima monument where the men are lifting the flags. That is autographed by Oliver North because I bought those for $30 a piece and Oliver North was on Radio Row signing autographs at that exact moment and I was, I was like, oh, he's famous. I have no idea what he's famous for, but I'll get his autograph. <laughs> and that is signed by Oliver North. And then if you're looking, uh, that is David Letterman to the left there on the YouTube channel along with all my libertarian books, including Blowback, which you should read by Chalmers Johnson uh, or any of Chalmers Johnson's books. Oh, goodness. All right, fellas. Any other thoughts about the press and not trusting your eyes with these people? Um, I, 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 don't, I don't want to get into the – we don't want to trust the press explicitly, right? You have, to, you have to sift through what they're saying. But you're not going to get better information from other people. You're getting, you want people who have actually gone out and verified some of the stuff that they're trying to tell you. So you have to kind of draw, you know, yeah, not you have to kind of walk from, that line. Yeah, not everything from the New York yeah. slimes and the Washington compost, mm -hmm. you know, is trash. Like, actually, does it seem like trash or not? Like, mm -hmm. here's the thing. If you read a lot mm -hmm. and you read history and you, like, the best thing that you can do is kind of read the biographies of, like, Lyndon Johnson or, like, 1980s politicians or government officials because the politicians the politics hasn't changed a lot since then and so if you can kind of get a feel you always get the, an understanding of the people who are out of the arena like they they don't have anything to lose they're just there to tell their story about what happened 30 years ago and reminisce and then their memoirs that will be great for teaching you what to trust mm -hmm. so I, I recommend robert caro's four books first well, a real great example of that is uh, the documentary I watched this weekend, Nixon by Nixon, which uh, they fought for a long time to keep all of Nixon's tapes uh, squirreled away in the libraries. Uh, but they all finally got released about 2013, 2014 or whatever. And somebody put together a document, a document there. Uh, <laughs> they put together the movie. I don't know why I can't say that, um, <laughs> but they put it together and it's really just, his words uh, during all of this stuff that was happening in a, in a timeline of his presidency. And then the things he was saying, he, he, he would show a speech of him saying something and then him on the phone with somebody saying, Oh man, that was just hor I had to say that because of this. And I don't want this to happen because of that. And expletive here and horrible racist or sexist things said here, you know, it's, uh, but they were talking about the bombings of, of, uh, Vietnam, Vietnam and Cambodia, and they were how, how they made the decisions on how to do that, and they wanted to carpet bomb it. At one time, they couldn't um, they couldn't bomb for a couple of days because it was raining really, really hard, monsoon season over there. Mm -hmm. And he's mad, and he's yelling at his chief of staff, telling him to get his guys up in the planes and get them bombing like they're supposed to be. And he didn't care about them, you know. He, they're supposed to be doing their jobs and, and calling them you know, horrible names. I mean, it was just it's an interesting look at what was really going on in those communications and those decisions being made in the white house that we're probably never, ever going to see again because yeah. nobody's ever going to record 
like Nate Nixon did. That's yeah. that was like his biggest mistake. So it's never going to happen. So we're never going to get good records of all of this. I don't know um, Trump. Mm. Uh, I, don't, I don't see him recording much of anything, but you never know. Maybe he's secretly recording it all so he can have a, a whole, you know, series of reality TV afterwards he can use it for. But are we going to get um, like a YouTube vlogger for president that's just going to vlog the whole thing and then go release it on like a YouTube Red series afterwards? I mean, I, I don't see it. it might be the next step. We've already got like a guy who used to be a uh, comedian is now in charge of Ukraine. Right. So, I mean, right. mm-hmm. who knows what's going to happen? Um, the people. 24. <laughs> so, so anyway, I, I like that movie, um, that documentary that was really eye opening on some of the things that even I wasn't aware of at the time, because like I said, these, these tapes were just released and, and you realize that, Oh, he wasn't really wanting to put a woman on the Supreme Court. He was lying about that horribly. Uh, and it was such a cynical move that he was playing. And he, he just freely admits it in this, in this conversation. So, um, was it, What was it called again? Nixon by Nixon. Okay. Uh, I saw it on HBO, so I don't know if it's on Netflix. Uh, the, other, the other thing I saw this weekend, too, was really good, was I finally got the end of, for the whole season of uh, The Brink which is an HBO series uh, kind of about the impending end of the world and, and how we try to stop it. And it's a comedy with Jack Black and Tim Robbins and John Larroquette and a bunch of really famous people doing great jobs. Uh, it's farcical. It's hilarious. But there are a lot of things that are said by Tim Robbins character that I think any libertarian would love to hear somebody say. Like I, one special line in there was, I don't want to be a part of this in administration anymore as the only guy getting laid, uh, causing everybody to be so sexually frustrated that we're doing nothing but b- bombing brown people. And I just stood up and said, yes, exactly. <laughs> so it's a great movie. It's, it's hilarious. It's, uh, and it's a really funny take on how things kind of can spin out of control because of the people in charge our humans who are flawed and just have their own agendas as it were uh harry go ahead final thoughts um let's see what a couple of things get out of the way um one i'd like to thank ryan hold to uh, continue patronage to the uh, low-key um wall twitch channel um it makes me you know feel bad we're not putting out enough episodes so i will you're not putting out any episodes because you're not sending me the audio give me the login it's not for you like, it's not no. for you but the, i do no, it i, I want to give it to the as bonus content oh okay so you can listen right. to this show okay you're fine i'm gonna expand your reach all right that's fine i own this network okay what what, what? Yeah, you know who you're talking to there's that's no it. stock I, pa- I paid for this microphone and that one so this is this is this is my microphone nope see <laughs> Joke's on you. I'm in charge. I paid for the Zoom account. <laughs> you pay for the microphone over there in Paul's chair. That's that's the microphone you paid for. This is my microphone. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I'll no, but a, the, I'll put a link to your little Twitch channel in the show notes too. So start, all these movies and books and all the recommendations and the show notes. I, I get more. Li- I get more live stream on my Twitch channel than you get on Facebook and YouTube. I'll be the judge of that when I take a look at this. Okay, good, good. Look at my analytics. Okay, good. I want you to. Uh, the other thing I want to also do is... Huge, huge ratings. So yeah, big. It's the biggest. Uh, I also want to give a, a shout out to Eskola Job Plus. Um, he was the butt of a lot of my jokes on Saturday night while we were gaming. He took it like a sport and, uh, you know, uh, he reamed back the heart, though. If you guys, if anyone who watched the streams, even though that my mic was muted, though, the entire time for some reason, like what audio was going through, you know, they ripped me a new one. And so all those me being Paul uh, angry at Eskola for the on the entire time, you gotta understand, he was mean to me first okay all right i don't want anyone to look at that and understand i was just mean to him he was mean first okay um the other thing is it is if you this document right the uh, with the afghan papers right combined with scott horton's book uh a fool's errand (laughs) just kind of just blows your mind yeah because that and then you understand like all the people who were talking about like they said like colin powell this is the information he probably just just saw going like wait a minute this what's going on this is crap this is saying what you're doing 
you know what you're doing and it makes and you're sh- if you if you haven't picked up a fool's errand pick it up pick the audio book up just anything just read scott Orton's book a fool's errand it's with this document too it just blows your mind it's gonna it'll it'll take your sunday from you because you're just gonna sit there and just stare off and go like wow they really did see this coming and they just yeah. keep charging ahead and you've tried to tell anyone about this and get anyone on this it's it's one of those tragic moments where it's hidden in a book and you have to get either someone to listen to something like this or read this and they're not going to notice it because it's this is too big or something like good for any like news or, or you know no one's going to do this on a new show and if it is it's going to be like quick 10 minutes done and arguing about it and try to argue it down and then try to have someone up there talk about how no no we do it we're saving lives you don't understand the terrorism threat. you don't understand the threat that's coming after you that's all you're gonna hear not this other you, crap you have to understand the currency of the news industry is access yeah that's true and too. so if, you, if you're sitting there putting in a lot of uh information that makes these people look bad they're not gonna give you access you know it's mm-hmm. one of the first impactful moments of my career working with abdul i said something very nasty about a democrat go to break cracks the intercom to me and he goes you realize we have to work with these people right you know so you can't be too critical you can't do things that they don't like or they don't give you access yep 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 but yeah those are my statements i'm done are you sure is there anything else and you know uh, yeah, no. Join the Discord. Oh yeah, yeah. Join the Discord thing. Um, jump in. Um, a lot of people come in. A lot of people also looking forward to uh, when Dear Leader gets done with those Pathway to Liberty episodes. We don't a lot have- of people are wanting those. We get a lot of that for that. And wait, people, people. Well, are any of them willing to volunteer to be a part of it? Um, I didn't see anyone volunteering. All right, to help. Well, just here, I don't have. I, I will happily talk to people about answering those basic questions, but I need, I need people to ask basic questions. I know too much. I, I can't come up with yeah. basic answers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's why I hate like, like I used to love being like some people's first thing to Liberty, but it's really hard. Cause you could like, like I told them, like you have to stop, you know, like I, like I mentioned it in the um, discord. It's like first, you know, I'm not going to like when it's, when someone really asked me questions, I was like, hey, I don't admit to have the best system. I just have a different system that allows choice. You know, it will allow different choices in the system that will allow whatever choice system that you want to make allow a decision of your choice you make. I won't remove, I don't want to remove anyone's choice unless right. your choice is to, you know, defraud, cause violence and physical harm. Yeah, yeah I was watching, I was watching a um, kind of one of those, um, redo of the old 70s old 80s tv shows like they did um uh, a live version of good times oh yeah and yeah. and in that ver in that version it was an old script from then and it was about an alderman and a younger alderman who was fighting mm-hmm. and trying to win and and the younger alderman didn't win and everybody was saying uh because people said we really liked your ideas you had new fresh ideas you were young you're ready to do this stuff uh, but it was pointed out by james he said the problem is, is that you're talking at people. You're not talking with them. You're not talking to them. You're not, you're not reaching them. And a lot of libertarians never get that point. They just think if they can uh, prophesize and lecture that people will go, Oh yeah, that makes sense. I understand that. But people, it just starts going over your head and they feel like you're being lectured to. You're not engaging with them and making them understand that you understand what they're thinking and what they're feeling and why this is important to them or what should be important to them. Uh, and that's where it all gets lost. Great point, Randy. Um, so I, I, for my final thought, I want to play a clip from Ken Burns, Vietnam. This is fairly early during the Kennedy administration. Just take a listen to this. We don't have a prayer of staying in Vietnam, President Kennedy privately told a friend that spring. These people hate us but I can't give up a piece of territory like that to the communists and then get the people to reelect me. There you go. (laughs) That, if you study our history, is the thinking of literally every single president. There's there's tape of Nixon in that documentary I was talking about where he says we have to do this before the election in order to get reelected. Yep. Uh, LBJ said it. Uh, it. It is. It is a common. It's the way that they think. 
It's why the people in the Kabul, they want to get ahead in their career and move up and maybe be the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, you know, David Petraeus is like, let's fudge the numbers. I've got heat. I might be Joint Chiefs someday. Um, and that's why when Donald Trump assassinates somebody, we question it. Yeah. The motives behind it, because we've seen this before. Because we've done our homework. We've studied our history, our history mm -hmm. in this country. Not just whatever Donald Trump says. Oh, this guy's a terrorist. Ah, good enough for me. Donald Trump says he's a terrorist. Let's go to war. Let's let's turn them into glass. Assholes. Yep. All right. Thanks so much for joining us here on this episode of We're Libertarians. We thank you so much for listening. We appreciate uh, all of our patrons, but we appreciate all of our listeners. If you are a listener, please share the program. That is the only way that we grow as people are searching for answers. As your friends and family, we try to do a non-threatening. What I try to do is try to get you to think, teach you how to think, teach you how to research this stuff, how to think about these things, give you the history give you the information so you're informed when you're talking to people you can share it with your friends and know that they're not going to get just get some libertarian screeching that turns people off we really are trying to do a service to not just the libertarian community but to the entire nation nay the world so please share this that's the only way that we're going to grow people in presidential election years are incredibly hungry for information and trying to understand what's going on and that's why this show is built that's why we set up the timestamps so you can look at the timestamps. So listen, hey, skip the chip chat if you're new. Don't worry about that. Just skip to minute 23. And then you'll hear them talk about that. Or you should hear this part about the media and what they said. Just skip to this part. You can skip the first hour. So we really tried to build every part of this in mind of, of sharing this information with your friends so they get this information. They understand what's going on. And I just ask you, you don't have to be a patron to support this show. It really does help. It helps us grow quickly. It helps us grow uh, in, in significant ways. Um, if you are a former patron and you're, you're hitting this part, please consider rejoining too. We'd love to have you come and rejoin. Um, all that is very important in helping us pay the bills. All of the information, like the news sites. You know, I got to pay for like half a dozen news sites and newspapers. The Wall Street Journal hit yesterday. That was $134 every six months. You know, th there's a lot of information bill sometimes that comes with this stuff uh, because when we're prepping this stuff i've got to have access to all those sites uh, i read them so you don't have to uh, <laughs> and then we source it all in our show notes so if you you can't listen to a show you can go and read the actual notes the outline of most of these shows so we're really trying to make this user friendly and if you're if you're hitting this particular point in the episode i know that you're a fan that you listen to every one of these shows and uh, I just ask, hey, please share it. Get on, you know, s s uh, uh, Instagram stories. If you go to your, uh, if you go subscribe in Spotify and you hit the share button in Spotify, you can flip it over to your Instagram stories or to your Facebook stories. That's a great way to put it in front of people. Uh, that, you know, maybe put a little arrow up in the top left saying play here. Uh, that's a great way to, to share it, but please just go to wearelibertarians.com, grab the episode, share it with your friends, tell more people about it. That's how we're going to grow. Um, we don't do a lot of marketing. We just rely on you to help spread the word. So uh, that and just organic searches. The majority of the people who listen to this show, you know this probably from your personal experience. I think, Harry, that might be how you came along. Yep. Literally, it's just you type libertarian into a search engine or Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, and you find, you search Libertarian, no, oh, these guys have been around for eight and a half, nine years. They're, they're talking about stuff I care about. And so we usually get picked first. And we, we treat that with a lot of respect. And we uh, hope that uh, you can trust us with your friends and family going into this presidential year. So it's just imperative that you share the show. Tag us and everything. I promise I'll retweet you uh, and, and share it too. You know, and if you've got a story about how this show has impacted you, or how it's impacted a friend, or if you have a great story about the show that we can share here on the show, love to read that to our audience so they know that uh, they're having an impact when they're sharing this stuff or donating on Patreon. So editor at wearelibertarians.com. And if you want to come on and ask me a bunch of questions, send it to that email too. All right. Thanks so much for joining us here on the program. Reinhold, Harry, thank you for being a part of it. And thank you so much for joining us. 
and we will be back next week. Tentatively, we're talking about war powers. So the debate about war powers. Todd Young, Harry, I don't know if you saw this news. Todd Young, our senator, mm -hmm. the Marine, yeah. Marine, is joining Mike Lee and Rand Paul in opposing giving Donald Trump a blank check on war powers and is going to vote with the Democrats to limit his ability to start a war with Iran. <sighs> would you ever is, say he would be the one to do that? Yeah, not Todd Young. The no. Marine. He, he's, so thanks oh. to Bob. All I got to say is thanks to Bob Grand for cheating and getting him in on to the ballot. Uh, you, we'll tell you that story some other time. But we'll talk a little bit more about that <laughs> next week as the vote looms. And then the week after that, we might have to talk about impeachment, even though I just don't care anymore. Yeah. All right. Thanks so much for joining us here on the program, and we'll see you next week.